All right, great. Um, all right, well, thank you, uh, Stephen, for, for inviting me here, and thanks to the committee, and thanks to Sierra for the, the great intro. Um, so I'm going to be talking um, about just some of my, my history in um, applying declarative logic programming in the area of uh, genomics and, uh, and molecular biology. Um, but just to kind of like uh, orient you a bit, I thought I'd just tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so um, for those of you who are of a certain age, you'll maybe remember that uh, Edinburgh University was once the, uh, the main kind of like yeah, hotbed of kind of good old fashioned logic programming. It's here for good old fashioned logic programming. Yay! <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> so I, yeah, I kind of like, um, this is where, it's not actually, yeah, the university there. I didn't go to, yeah, study in a castle at the top of a hill like in <laughs> Harry Potter or anything like that. But um, that's a, a nice picture of Edinburgh. But yeah, I did my undergrad there uh, way back in the yeah, 1990s. Um, I, at the time, I actually really just wanted to learn about like neural networks and kind of like, you know, actual real kind of like, you know, um, synthetic kind of like human brains and things like that, but they just taught me all this kind of like prologue and frame stuff. And at the time, I was like, <laughs> what is this? This isn't how brains work. It actually turned out to be kind of like really cool and quite useful. Um, after that, um, I moved to the States um, to Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I kind of moved around a little bit back and forth as a kind of simplified picture. Um, this is a picture of the lab there. I don't actually work in that nice domed building at the top of the lab either. I'm way down by the bay near the train tracks down there, but <laughs> it's a nice picture. Um, I actually did my PhD at Edinburgh University like remotely afterwards, more with a kind of like a focus in kind of like genomics and ontologies. And then my kind of like current career has kind of, um, you know, back at the lab again, kind of like, you know, I, I don't really do so much kind of research more. I'm more just writing the grants and writing kind of progress reports and so on. So yeah, I'm on a number of kind of like different projects projects here. And normally, um, yeah, if I'm kind of like giving a keynote, I'll maybe pick some of these, these projects and kind of like weave a little narrative through them. So, um, you know, back in the old day, I designed um, um, a modular kind of like early proto knowledge graph like database called Chado that was actually very widely adopted in the genomics community. I've been part of the, the gene ontology since the beginning. And from that, we kind of like spun off a number of other kind of ontologies like Uberon, anatomy ontology, Mondo, a, a disease ontology. You'll hear later on today about the, um, the BioLink model from um, that Sierra leads that we use as part of the, the translator program that we'll hear from, um, from Tyler. Um, and I've also been involved in a number of kind of like efforts to build tools for building ontologies and so on. And I'll, I'll mention some of these later on. But you know, normally I might pick one of these and say, kind of like, yay me, I, <laughs> yeah, I was part of a team, we built this kind of thing. But yeah, sometimes it's, it's kind of fun to hear about, you know, <laughs> flops and failures too, you know. So you're going to hear about my, <laughs> you know, my own kind of like Spider-Man the musical or the cats or the room or something like that. And I think this is even funnier if people keep making the same mistake again and again. And <laughs> so we'll hear a bit of that, but don't worry, we'll, we'll finish it off with some kind of like projects that have actually, you know, actually managed to kind of like stick and have been a little bit more uh, successful. So some of the drive here um, really comes back to a kind of like a, a strong drive I have for pushing declarative programming. That's why I'm so, you know, happy to be here today. And, you know, this was really, you know, after going from like learning kind of like prologue and kind of like scheme and so on at, at university, suddenly I got my first job in genomics and I was just handed this kind of like stack of kind of like monolithic Perl scripts and bash scripts and it was like, this is, this is just awful. I mean, how can, <laughs> where's the logic? The logic is all intertwined in this and there was these ad hoc flat files being exchanged and it was just, I, yeah, I just thought there had to be a better way here. So I, I got involved in some, you know, some projects that aim to at least bring, you know, some modular programming at least to this and start breaking down some of these modular scripts into, you know, into little kind of like reusable modules with encapsulation and so on. So I was quite involved with the, um, the BioPerl project. Yeah, way back in the, people don't do this, in, you know, but back in the day, people would coalesce around a language and all the Perl programmers in genomics would go, yay, let's do BioPerl and we'll put our code together in one module and all the Python people would go and make BioPython and Ruby people and Java people as well and they did, they did something kind of odd, but, <laughs> but anyway. Um, and you know, these, all these different frameworks, they had a kind of like the same kind of characteristics. They would 
They would build kind of standard parsers for the somewhat standard formats we had in, in, in bioinformatics. They would have, um, they were largely object oriented. They would have kind of like standard data models for representing genes and sequences and phylogenetic trees and things like that, standard logical operations, scripts and so on. And you know, this was to me more satisfying, but it's still, you know, it, it really, the logic, you know, the logic was still far too kind of entwined with all this procedural code. And I just wanted something more declarative. And I thought, okay, well, we've got BioPerl, BioPython, BioJava, BioRuby. Let's have BioProlog as well. <laughs> 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 and I just thought this, was, this is going to be awesome. So um, I ended up calling this um, BlipKit, uh, Biomedical uh, Logic Programming uh, Toolkit. Um, it's, it's there on GitHub. I tried to get the old documentation up and running before this, but I, I wasn't quite successful. But I'll walk you through some of the, some of the basic concepts. Um, and at, yeah, at the core of it on the left, um, yeah, it was really kind of like uh, oriented around a kind of modular set of data log modules for um, representing different aspects of, of biology. And so you, there would be um, a data log module for representing genomes, for representing RNA structures, for representing ontologies that we use a lot, phylogenetic trees, kind of like systems biology modules, you know, based around kind of like the, the SBML formalism and so on. And this, this was largely a kind of like pure prologue kind of data log subset. It was consisted of, um, you know, essentially kind of like type definitions for, you know, for your facts, your unit clauses, and then kind of like just simple kind of like um, horn type rules um, that you could encode the actual kind of like logic about this data. So kind of similar to what my colleagues in the BioPerls and so on were doing with kind of object orient orientation, kind of like coupling the data and the behavior, but in, in a way that I thought was much, much cleaner. And then on top of that, we had a kind of like less pure kind of like, you know, um, standard kind of like SWI prologue uh, with lots of kind of like parsers and serializers. And yeah, it's actually got a really nice library for working with just standard things like kind of XML and JSON and so on. And I thought it was great because you could just write the same code, you know, just with, you know, 10% of, you know, of the code in a much more kind of clean and, and declarative way. And, you know, and the, the end result of this is you could take take your other files and parse them into, into this, these unit clauses, take databases, compile them into this, and just do you know, all of your kind of like uh, answering just using standard SWI prolog SLD uh, resolution. So you know, I, I want to find genes that are located in other genes. It was a really simple kind of clean query like this. So um, and I think where this kind of like really shone as well is for doing kind of like complex queries over genomic databases. The standard state of the art at that time was to use Perl kind of object relational mappers and so on. And it was you know, really kind of a bit messy and kind of complicated. So um, I developed some kind of like bindings using um, a framework developed by someone called Christopher Drexler called SQL Compiler. And this is really nice because you could essentially take prolog programs and compile a certain subset of them into into SQL queries, and you could feed in your, um, your rules in there as well. And this meant you could take um, a big, messy, complicated relational database like Ensemble and just specify a simple query as kind of like um, a set of prolog clauses. Your rules would be compiled in, it would do SQL queries, and you could do a certain amount of kind of like computation just naturally within, um, within the logic programming environment directly itself. So I just thought, you know, Declarative programming for the win. Everyone is going to you know, love this. And um, yeah, it was quite nice for being able to do things like formalize um, kind of like uh, you know, inference over RNA structures to be able to automatically classify structures like RNA uh, pseudonauts and so on. Some of this made it its way into actual kind of like you know, somewhat used um, you know, you know, applications like the, the RNA ontology and the sequence ontology. Um, you know, we, I also came up with a kind of a, essentially a, something equivalent to the, the Allen interval calculus for the Allen interval algebra for, uh, for kind of like uh, genome intervals as well. So there's some kind of nuances there. You've got kind of like reverse complementation because genes can be on one side or the other side. And you know, this just seemed like um, a much more natural way of kind of being able to kind of express relationships you know, rather than writing a lot of kind of procedural code and kind of like tying this in with database calls and so on. So there's, um, there's um, a manuscript on that as well. So did, 
Did everyone love this? <laughs> I was really hoping they would, but you know, I took it to logic programming conferences, and no, they did not. <laughs> they didn't love that. You know, I would go there, and people would expect to hear like really awesome talks about, wait, so maybe you're going to use logic programming to program DNA and do really cool things. And it was like, no, it's just, it just makes it much easier to <laughs> engineer the complicated programs that, that we have. Um, and just the fact that I was using standard kind of like deductive inference rather than say the latest, I don't know, answer set programming or something, just made it a bit less interesting to them. Not universally. I think I met a lot of people at these conferences, like Jan Bielemaker, the developer of SWI Prolog. He totally got it. A lot of the, the industry people really got it. They were doing analogs of this, but in kind of closed source systems. They were like, yeah, yeah, that makes, <laughs> that makes sense. We're doing similar things to that. But yeah, and then I, I took it back over to you know, my kind of like colleagues in the, the bioinformatics community, and they were just, nope. <laughs> Prolog is weird. You're weird. <laughs> We're just happy to just live in this morass of <laughs> Perl spaghetti code. So um, yeah, I, I, can t I got derived a lot of benefit from it. But yeah, um, I think overall, just you know, declarative programming alone can be a hard sell. You know, th there's got to be a bit more of a kind of like evaluated proposition in there. It takes people a long time to change their engineering pr um, processes, and really sometimes you have to meet people where they're at. Is just yeah, it's a big jump to go from something like Perl to kind of like, you know, Prolog or something like that. So anyway, after that, I went back to doing kind of more normal kind of bioinformatics type things. But then I got kind of hooked again because I was doing a lot of things involving uh, computational workflows. So, um, you know, in genomics and kind of like, you know, um, high throughput molecular biology in general, you are kind of like assaying a lot of different molecules and like DNA sequences. And there's often complicated kind of... Uh, you know, computational workflows that will, will then kind of like flow from that. You've got your sequence reads, you assemble the sequence reads, you align them, you do gene prediction, you do functional annotation. And this um, often leads to, again, kind of like, you know, spaghetti logic of kind of Perl, bash, C, maybe kind of make files as well. But, you know, workflow engines should be, you know, if this is, if we can't get, you know, a declarative system from this, then we're, we're, doing, we're doing something wrong here because this should be inherently declarative, you know. You, you can just think of, you know, maybe tasks as kind of like grounding of particular rules. You can just express the logic here as a simple set of kind of like, you know, horn clauses here where you've got a task, the head of the rule, and you've got some dependencies. They're the, the body of the rule, and you can do this recursively and so on. Um, yeah, you maybe want some additional, you know, adornments because you don't want to keep recomputing the same thing every time. So you maybe want to memo, memoize this on disk or, or in... Um, uh, or in, in databases, so yeah, um, I thought, well, there's BioPerl, BioJava. There's not been a BioMake yet, so let's do yeah. <laughs> BioMake. You know, um, and I thought we'll cheekily cap capitalize on the the popularity of make files as as a system, um, which you know had seen some use in um, for workflows as well, and you know, um, kind of learned my lesson a little bit this time. You know, the very first iteration of this was you would specify the, the pipeline directly in Prolog. You know, the community weren't too into that. But then um, my colleague Ian Holmes um, said, hey, look, um, we could just you know, make a kind of new make uh, facade for this and allow people to actually write make files, compile it down into this Prolog, and just allow people to kind of like optionally adorn this with sort of like additional expressivity from logic. So um, that was his idea, and he, you know, we both kind of took this and uh, kind of right ran with it. And we ended up with you know, what I think is actually a really nice system. Um, you can, um, it is completely compatible with, um, it is a superset of um, GNU make, the, the syntax, uh, but there's also additional features in there that get around some of the limitations of make files. You can have multiple wildcards um, per target in the make file. You don't have to rely on kind of like, you know, file system time changes. You can you know, trigger changes based on changes of the content. So if you accidentally touch your, your FASTA sequence file, you don't necessarily trigger everything after it because you've got an MD5 checksum on that. It was kind of containerized. Um, it had really nice support for being able to kind of like fire jobs onto kind of like clusters and so on. And then if you really wanted to, you could kind of like start putting in little kind of, um, you know, additional kind of like constraints and um, logic programs in there that allow you to kind of like generate the large space of all the different kind of like computations that you, you want to do and so on. So this was, you know, made a little bit more successful. We actually had a, yeah, a small but very happy uh, user base. 
Um, most people only use the, the, the make uh, facade and, um, and uh, you know, the, the wildcard syntax extensions. Um, but you know, I think one of the reasons for this is we really delivered some additional functionality that you wouldn't get from just purely the declarative framework. You know, people really like the ability to kind of like connect with kind of like uh, job systems like QBS and Slurm and things like that. But you know, ultimately we were doing other things and we didn't really have the resources to support it and we didn't really you know, um, you know, want to kind of encourage people to come here when at the same time, you know, this, just as we were getting started, this is when suddenly there was a renewed interest in this field and we saw frameworks like Nextflow, Snakemake became very popular. Um, we've got kind of workflow systems like Cromwell and languages like CWL and DWL and so on. So yeah, it just seemed like, okay, the big players have kind of like moved in here. You know, I think this was a nice, nice kind of experiment. You know, I think we still have a, still, still have a few users who, who use this, but yeah, maybe a little bit more, more successful there. So jumping from um, more kind of like genomics into um, ontologies, which is um, an area I work in a lot. Um, you know, we use ontologies a lot in, in biomedicine. Uh, you know, this is some of the ontologies I work on here, like the gene ontology, uh, the chemical entities ontology, um, you know, environment ontology. And, and these are all developed separately by different groups, but they all interop interoperate with one another. We've got kind of like connections between them. And we have a kind of framework called OBO that ho helps to kind of like um, organize a lot of these. And really the goal of these ontologies is to represent knowledge about these different domains in a declarative fashion. So you would think that you know, ontology should be you know, just the ultimate declarative system. Uh, we want to encode this knowledge in a non-procedural way. Uh, a lot of the foundations in ontologies are actually in um, first order logic. And the way you know, things are meant to work with, with ontologies is you um, specify this knowledge and then you use, um, use standard kind of like description logic reasoners to perform inference over, over this. And this inference is based, you know, normally on kind of like, you know, sound and complete systems and so on, things that, you know, will make many of us in the room kind of like very, very happy and, and so on. And you can think of this um, in terms of, um, you know, essentially kind of like mapping some of these ontology constructs into um, just standard kind of like, you know, horn logic or similar kind of like paradigms. So one of the key things we want to do in ontologies is subsumption, you know, cat is a, um, yeah, cat is a mammal, is an animal, kind of like, um, you know, genes are, are features, coding genes are genes and so on. So you can represent kind of like subsumption, kind of like trivially just with these kind of like um, um, unary kind of like um, um, clauses. Um, you've got things like kind of like property chains if you want to uh, represent how if A regulates B and B regulates C, then A regulates C, and you've got the kind of composition of positive and negative and so on. And you can do kind of like, um, kind of like, you know, cool things like classification as well. And constraints and ontologies are, are very useful for us as well. So you can, you can specify constraints such as the fact that hair follicle development is something that only occurs in mammals. So if you try and annotate this function to a gene from a bacteria or something, then you know, your system can tell you that um, this is something that is not biologically possible. And you know, this, with this we can kind of avoid a lot of um, spaghetti code for, for being able to kind of like reason over biology. Um, yeah, but um, yeah, the, the main system used in, um, um, for reasoning in ontologies is um, a framework called uh, Description Logics. Uh, this really rose to prominence you know, in the kind of like 1990s, the early 2000s. There was actually kind of like you know, a big battle in the kind of ontology knowledge representation community about what formalism was going to win. And you know, the description logic people kind of essentially you know, won that. But you know, one of the main characteristics of description logics is it's a fragment of first order logic. Um, and the main prop property that is kind of sold by these people is that it guarantees decidability. Um, and you, you can you know, essentially kind of like get a sense of um, description logics and the main system here, Al, the web ontology language from this table on the left. You know, essentially everything is kind of like framed in kind of like set theoretic form. And you know, essentially Al is really just um, you know, a language for, for building kind of like uh, set builder expressions. So you've got kind of like conjunction, disjunction, negation, um, and kind of like, you know, uh, 
quantification and so on. And you know, this was you know, felt by many to be the formalism that made most sense for uh, representing um, ontologies. But unfortunately, um, decidability really limits a lot of the things that you can do. So even kind of things that you might think would be simple, such as classifying structures like this benzene ring as being cyclic, um, you know, this might seem surprising we've been able to do this, you know, using 1970s logic programming technology. You just kind of like have <laughs> a rule to classify a six carbon ring and you just say, okay, yeah, there's <laughs> carbon one, two, three, four, five, and it goes around and uh, you're back at the same carbon again. But this is actually not possible in uh, <laughs> description logics because you end up kind of like the way the kind of like systems have been shaped to kind of like build this in would essentially kind of like, you know, uh, you would lose the, the decidability kind of like property. At least we're doing this at the kind of like the terminological or T-box level. There's, you can kind of do it with swirl rules, but then you still, you can actually use it for, for kind of classification there. So this, you know, seems to me, you know, kind of quite a big um, kind of like disadvantage. Um, and I'm not really sure that, you know, decidability is really something that is worth preserving if you lose <laughs> key properties like this. So. Um, yeah, and there's, there's other issues as well. It turns out, you know, because it's based on kind of binary predicates that representing temporalized relationships, you know, the fact that this finger may be part of me at this time, but, you know, if it gets chopped off, then it's no longer part of me. That actually gets, to, turns out to be quite hard to represent in OWL as well. And people kind of come up with ways of doing it that end up like creating these spaghetti-like lattices from your ontologies. So we see the kind of the spaghetti kind of like arising again due to some of these, uh, these limitations. And, you know, on top of all that, it's, it's kind of complicated, you know. It's, this is the RDFXML serialization of just uh, one of the classes from the gene ontology. And, you know, this is really to represent some kind of like fairly, fairly simple axioms. So at the time, I thought, okay, well, maybe we can come up with an alternative to this. So I came up with something called um, Obolog. Um, this was essentially... Um, you know, a logical formalization of a format that we had developed in the gene ontology that actually became very kind of like popular amongst kind of bioinformaticians because it was actually quite, you know, simple syntactically to use. But people kind of like criticized it because it wasn't really based in um, kind of like formal logic. So we said, okay, let's take this. Let's give it a formal logic underpinning. We'll actually not restrict ourselves to decidable systems. We'll use um, the full, um, you know, set of things that we're able to, to say with, uh, with first order logic. We actually used, there's a language called common logic, it's an ISO standard, so we kind of like based it in this. Um, it's first order logic, you know, with some kind of syntactic kind of higher order features as well. And this really gave us kind of like complete expressivity. Um, and, but rather than forcing people to, you know, reason over this using a kind of first order logic theorem prover, we said, okay, well, for the, the majority of purposes, you can just take this subset, map it to something like um, horn clauses and just do kind of like highly scalable data log reasoning. And this, this kind of actually covers like 99% of the things you want to do. And for the rest of it, you can kind of like modularize it and then go, with, okay, I'm going to use a full full theorem prover for this like little mini subset here, bring the results back in and kind of like combine them together like this. Um, and, you know, it's this kind of like, you know, made, um, yeah, seem to make a lot of sense. You know, the basic ideas illustrated here, you've maybe got kind of um, an upper ontology or an ontology of relationship types, uh, things like, you know, relationship types like part of. You can declare statements about these using kind of variable free simple unit clauses. This is using the kind of like the or Lisp fans, you know, common logic as a, a native kind of um, prefix um, type, you know, way of specifying these. So you say part of is both transitive and it's a temporal relationship. Then you've got your domain ontologies, like your anatomy ontologies that tells you things like, you know, um, you know, finger is part of a hand and hand is part of the arm and so on. And we use this kind of like, you know, rather than making the the relationship, the predicate itself, there's this sort of like syntactic kind of se second order thing here where we have a, a holds predicate. And then we can essentially kind of like um, combine these together with Obolog semantics and get the, this is essentially the kind of like the true semantics of these relationships. It's got uh, existential quantification because what we want to do here is reason about, you know, 
the actual properties of individual instances of fingers and hands and so on. So, you know, this is the full expansion. It's kind of like, you know, it's, it's got lots of existentials. It's maybe kind of like, you know, harder to reason with. But you don't actually need to reason with um, this, this form the major majority of the time. You can just reason essentially over what now is called the, the T-box or the class level axioms. And then this just translates into something that is essentially just, um, just a kind of like a horn rule. And this, you know, this just scales really nicely. You know, we came up with proof of principles. You could do this for all of the main ontologies we're using and get very, you know, um, you know, get results kind of like, you know, instantly. You know, meanwhile, over on the description logic side, you know, the, a lot of these reasoners that were nice and decidable, you know, just ground to a halt when we actually gave them actual real-world ontologies. So I thought, okay, this, yeah, this is this is something that. Um, yeah, it's going to be popular, but the <laughs> the owl community really did not like this. They were just I would I would I would explain it to them, and they would say it's based on common logic. It's undecidable, and I was like, but yeah, but look, I can. This is the stuff we want to do. We can just do this, and you can reason over it, and you get it's, it's undecidable, and, <laughs> and it's, yeah, and uh, yeah, it's still to this day I, I don't quite understand that, but you know, the, essentially, kind of like owl won the the kind of like the the logic wars and ontologies, and there's there's many things to, you know, having OWL is be definitely better than not having anything at all. Um, we use this, we use OWL and OWL reasoners kind of constantly, you know, we use it um, for classification in our ontologies. You can leverage ontologies like the, the Kebby chemical entity ontology to um, essentially get complete automatic classification um, of your ontology. You can link all these ontologies together. Um, it's you know, it's better than having nothing, but it's definitely, you know, very restricted to compared to the kind of things that we could have had. And you, we essentially end up having to kind of like work around a lot of the limitations. And you, you end up essentially kind of like proliferating spaghetti around the, around the outside. But, you know, maybe some, some lessons here were that, you know, um, you know the, the description logic people definitely had some kind of like nice tooling. It maybe hasn't advanced so much since <laughs> this time, but um, you know the the protege ontology development environment from version four onwards was natively supports OWL. Um, the reasoners are actually interoperable. You can just take whatever ontology, as long as it's in OWL, and any one of these reasoners, and just plug them, and it will just work. You don't have to kind of like tweak anything. So um, this really highlights the kind of importance I think of standards, and I think the description logic. Community did a really good job just kind of rallying around, around Al and just doing the hard work of going to these W3C meetings and kind of like saying, you know, we need this, this, this it to look like this and, you know, this, this problem over here. And it was a tedious, you know, progress that, you know, process that took years and years. But at the end of it, you've actually got tools that are interoperable. And sorry, logic community, um, <laughs> you guys, you've just got to, you know, beef up on the, on the standards here because you know, you can't even decide if variables <laughs> should be leading uppercase letters or lowercase letters and you just yeah it's i know it doesn't seem much for all of you to kind of like take this kind of like you know this logic program over here maybe rewrite it you know using a slightly different syntax but this just doesn't really scale for engineering purposes and there is an iso standard around common logic but for years it, it really stuck. It was full of mistakes, and <laughs> the process developed. It was not open compared to the W3C process. So standards are, you know, really, really important here. Okay, so moving on to the, um, you know, the, the next area, which is declarative area, uh, querying of biomedical databases. So <laughs> this is, yeah, this is a debate we used to have in kind of transla the translator project that you'll hear about later on as well. It's, you know, APIs are great, and it's great we have standards for APIs like Open, a open API and Swagger. Um, but, you know, what you end up doing is being very restricted by whatever the API can, can offer you. And we've got all of these, these databases, and they have kind of like all these query planners, and you can just give it a very kind of expressive, complicated query, and I'll kind of figure out the best way to, to resolve this. But we end up just going one <laughs> call at a time, one call at a time, getting the results, kind of chaining them back together with a bunch of kind of like spaghetti on the, on the client side. 
So I think um, you know, a big win here has, um, to give the semantic web community credit, has been um, Sparkle, um, the semantic web uh, triple store query language. Um, it's, you know, it's quite nice that you can now take um, you know, many of these, these triple stores that are open um, on the web. There's a lot of very nice ones in uh, the biomedical domain, like the entire Uniprop uh, protein database is all available to query um, via Sparkle. Um, there's some services we use in Translator, like Ubergraph, that give you kind of like pre-reasoned all of the different ontologies in Obo pre-reasoned. And you can, you can query these, and you can do actually kind of quite powerful kind of complex queries and the, you know, the query planner, everything will, will take care of it. And it's, it's definitely, I think, a big um, improvement. But there's some things I, you know, I find, you know, I don't love so much about Sparkle. It can be, can be very verbose. And to me, this is the, you know, the killer is that it lacks composability. There's not really the equivalent of, oh, I should say SQL views. But you, know, you, you end up having to rewrite the same kind of like you know, logic again and again. And additionally, there's this kind of impedance mismatch um, that we see with kind of query languages between um, the query language and the code that that query is embedded in. Yeah, at least with kind of like SQL, you've got kind of like various ORMs and SQL builders. But I think for with Sparkle, people are still essentially building up kind of like strings in their code and doing, doing this kind of thing a lot. So um, yeah, an, an example here might be if we want to take a you know, uh, query, this is on the, the EBI triple store, which is um, effect, you know, unfortunately no more. You, you maybe want to take um, a query that is constraining things to say only mouse genes. That's the NCBI taxon ID for mouse. And you might want to compose this with this more you know, nested complicated query that uh, essentially narrows down your query to um, you know, a region of the, uh, of the genome. Um, and if you do want to compose these, you have to essentially manually compose them together. There's not really the equivalent of, of kind of like views and SQL and so on. So I thought, okay, well, maybe this is, you know, this is just a really sort of simple niche, but kind of like nice area where we can apply uh, logic programming. Um, and um, we developed something called um, Sparkle Prog, and the basic idea here is that, you know, in contrast, it's intended to be compact and expressive. It allows you to do composable uh, building blocks, essentially as kind of like simple horn logic uh, programs, and it allows you to kind of like mix in some of your, um, some of the logic that you need to do on the client side um, in essentially the same language. So. Uh, the basic idea is here that you've got some rules that can be you know, written once and then reused again and again. And then this really drastically reduces the size of your query. So in contrast to the, you know, the queries we saw on the previous sc screen, this really just distills down to the, you know, the essence of what it is that you want. And then the Sparkle Prog engine will essentially take care of um, you know, compiling this down, translating it into a Sparkle query. And there's also facilities in there for essentially splitting up the program and doing some of it you know, using the, the remote engine and some of it doing locally by doing kind of like iteration and so on. Um, so um, you know, we, um, I, you know, some of this was developed just before um, uh, there's something called the, the, the biohackathon series that um, has this you know, er, you know, origins back in the kind of like the biopearl days and these usually happen in, um, in Japan now and this is where I met actually Will and uh, some others, uh, uh, Piotr as well. So it actually gained quite a few fans there, you know, Japanese, you know, going back to, what was it, the fifth, fifth, gen, fifth generation, yeah, there's still, still some logic programming lovers in there so we got quite a few uh, pull requests on it there. Um, but you know, ultimately, at the uh, at the end of the day, you know, Sparkle has a lot of great things going for it, and you know, I've got to give it credit for things like um, going beyond what you can do with SQL. You know, having things like URIs for interoperability, um, paths for graph-like data, and again, uh, standards here are key. And, and I think one thing I've really got to credit Sparkle with is in contrast to relational databases, is kind of really pushing this culture of having open endpoints for biological data. You know, if 
Back in the day, you told a kind of like a system and you know, a database administrator for your relational database, hey, we want to just allow anyone on the web to query this. They would go, what? You're <laughs> crazy. Why would you want to do that? But I think it's really nice that we've got this culture where you can, you can get a lot of the, um, you can do a lot of this very powerful querying over the, these endpoints. And there's some great endpoints out there like the, the Uniprot one. And this is still surprising to me, but at the end of the day, this lack of composability, it just, it doesn't really seem to be such an issue for a lot of the users. They're happy to just write big string generation programs for generating Sparkle queries or just copying and pasting, you know, giant files of Sparkle queries and tweaking a variable here. But yeah, people are happy doing that, I guess. So. <laughs> but anyway, now to, <laughs> now to some things that I think, you know, have actually been, you know, really seen a little bit more, more uptake. And, you know, rather than kind of like thinking about the, the, the kind of programming language spaghetti here, there's, you know, we have this major problem in, um, in biology of, you know, essentially data spaghetti. And, you know, we, we're, we're really bad at kind of like managing data. We're really bad at kind of like describing that data and coming up with kind of like standards for describing that data. And we end up with little communities of people and data scientists. They love to just do things with CSVs and pandas and maybe kind of like big HDF5 files. And then semantic web people kind of like love using um, kind of like, you know, Sparkle and, you know, Shackle and Shex for describing the data. Some people try and use OWL for describing data. And that's, that's, that's a mismatch. OWL is a knowledge representation language for open world kind of like representation and reasoning. You get into all kinds of trouble if you try and use this to actually represent um, the kind of information you're exchanging between, uh, between systems. And you've got all the kind of like people who just like kind of like classic you know, kind of like engineer popular frameworks like JSON schema, SQL DDL, and so on. So, um, yeah, we've also got this kind of proliferation of different kinds of uh, database entities, different standards, different ontologies, and so on. Um, and really, we don't have great ways of um, interoperating amongst all of these. So this is what led us um, to develop something called uh, LinkML, the Link Data Modeling Language. Um, and so this actually, you know, uh, arose partly out of the, again, the translator project. So one of the first um, you know, um, models that was developed using LinkML was, uh, was the BioLink model that you'll hear about later. But the basic idea here was that it would allow data modelers to essentially author simple um, YAML files, um, optionally annotating these using ontologies. It was designed to allow people to do this in as democratic a way as possible so that data scientists could do this, bio-curators who didn't have a lot of technical training could do this, and to make the language as expressive as possible, but just to allow people to only use the subset that they need to, and then essentially compile down to some of these other frameworks like OWL and JSON-LD context, JSON schema, Python data classes, you know, it's a, another thing that's very important for getting kind of like broad, broad uptake of, of your framework. And then this would essentially allow people to just use the tools that they need um, without having to kind of like commit to one camp or the other. So people could author in LinkML and then go off and use kind of like the semantic web stack with JSON-LD and Sparkle and triple stores and so on. Or they could choose to ignore that if they want and just go and put things in their relational database or, or a Mongo database. So you can use the right tools for the right job with no uh, literal or, or no lock-in. So this is actually, we've been quite pleased with the, with the adoption of this. This is slides a bit out of date now. We've got, um, we've got a kind of like a monthly community call that we have you know, quite a large number of different people um, coming along, kind of like contributing to the code base, developing tools based around this, kind of like data entry tools and so on. Um, and um, just to kind of like give you a sense of what it is, you know, it's um, you know, essentially in two parts. You know, one part of this is um, a standard uh, metadata model for structuring your data. Um, this really has its origin in kind of like, you know, in some ways in kind of like old, good old fashioned AI kind of frame based systems. Um, and we actually take some of the terminology from frames like slots and so on. Um, so you've got a kind of like, um, a kind of like a simple core meta model where you've got different kind of elements in your language uh, with kind of like classes, slots and so on. And then um, we've got a set of tools as well. And um, yeah, in contrast to maybe some of the semantic web tooling, we, we couple these things a little bit more. And even though anyone's free to develop their own tools for LinkML, 
it helps people to have a set of standard tools um, that are just there and kind of like work at the bat. And this allows you to do things like validate your data, convert your data, do kind of like code generation, uh, you know, um, create data entry tooling for kind of curators to enter data using your data model, as well as some, some tools to be able to kind of like essentially infer schemas from, um, from messy data. And so this um, just kind of shows you one, one feature of this where you can maybe um, define elements from your domain. So maybe you're just, I've got a simple domain where you've got kind of uh, people in the domain. So you've got a person. A person might have um, uh, an age and years. That range of that is, is an integer. Obviously, it gets a little bit more kind of like complicated than this. You've got kind of various other features as well. But this is just to give you a sense of how this compiles down into um, all of these different frameworks like JSON schema and Python, SQL DDL, OWL, and so on. Now, we've got a nice um, little kind of like, you know, optional add-on for this called LinkML data log. And the basic idea is that you can, um, just as with some of the, um, the earlier frame-based systems, like I don't know if anyone remembers things like uh, the Flora 2 frame-based system that's based on uh, XSB, is you can essentially start extending your schema and put in kind of like more, more logic in here. You can actually embed kind of like arbitrary logical rules, but you can actually, you know, start, you know, defining new um, meta predicates like transitive closure of so that you can have um, a schema representing a person. Um, you've a schema, you know, a person has an attribute, you know, a friend of that takes as its range another person. And then you've got a kind of essentially a transitive version of that predicate called in network of. Um, and that's essentially the transitive closure of the, the friend of uh, predicate. And then you can essentially kind of like give um, the system asserted data. So maybe it kind of like, you know, just a list of people and they're kind of like direct asserted networks. And then you can essentially run the LinkML data log reasoner and get yeah, the transitive closure of all of these predicates. So that's a fairly simple example, but you can essentially put you know, arbitrary kind of like uh, horn clauses in there and use this as a kind of like you know, optional kind of extension add-on into the system. So with that, just to maybe kind of like summarize on the, the LinkML system itself, um, you know, this system really arose out of a, a, a genuine need. Um, we thought just within the biomedical community, but it's actually being you know, picked up by a lot of people in, in other domains as well. People really just needed a way of being able to kind of like describe their data, uh, to model it in, in a way that wasn't kind of like tied you know, to one system or another that would allow them to kind of gradually add the expressivity that they, they need over time. And you know, it was important to, to meet people where they're at, you know, rather than saying, if you want to use this framework, you've got to commit to using the semantic web and turning everything into RDF and turning everything into R IRIs and using these kind of like complicated, strange exchange formats. You know, we said, no, let's try and meet people where, where they're at. If people want to work with JSON, then let's provide ways of, of working with JSON or YAML or, or TSVs, or you can work with RDF if you want to. And we really tried hard to make, you know, the, the simple things simple. Uh, but give people the option to kind of extend that if they if they really need to, and then just to make sure that the the tooling itself is well integrated and 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 easy to use, and yeah, there's maybe some aspects of, of the system that are not theoretically perfect, but really we try and prize kind of like utility over over perfection here, and you know we're starting to see just yeah a lot of uptake of the of the system here. So with that. Um, I just want to leave with just a, a little coda. You know, I think you know, most of my talks these days are actually about uh, generative AI rather than <laughs> logic programming or anything like that. But it's it's fun to it's fun to definitely come back to this. But you know, I I really do think you know that with the, the ad, advent of kind of instruction based large language models, um, everything in in our realm is going to be like really you know majorly impacted by this. Um, I really feel that kind of like text is the new declarative representation. Um, and you know, hybrid systems, you know, systems that combine uh, generative AI with uh, symbolic reasoning, kind of like you know, classic uh, declarative programming, will, is going to be incredibly important here. And then I think you know, having declarative programming as a way of maybe retrospectively explaining um, the reasoning here, rather than as a kind of prospective specification, is something that's going to be important. And um, if you're interested in some of the work that we're, we're doing on this, um, I've dropped a few URLs. We've got a system called 
onto GPT um, and curate GPT. And we're starting to kind of like build these little web assistants for a lot of the databases we work on. So you can go and chat to, chat to them and kind of like make queries over them and so on. And so with that, I just want to kind of like thank um, all of the people involved. This, um, these are all the people involved in just the successful <laughs> components of talk. I'll, t I'll take the blame for <laughs> the various parts that, yeah, that didn't, didn't work out so well. But yeah, I especially want to give a shout out to Sierra, who's been kind of like key on the, the LinkML project, um, and Harold Solbrig um, over there, who's one of the, you know, one of the key people behind um, the LinkML framework itself. And with that, uh, I think I can just take any questions. Steven. Um, maybe I'll talk into the mic. Um, um, so uh, I'm trying to kind of, um, that was a great presentation. Thank you mm -hmm. so much. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the relationship between Link ML and BioLink, mm -hmm. is it sort of like, is it too simplistic of me to think in terms of like Link ML, ML being like the schema mm -hmm. for the BioLink model YAML file? That, that's great, but it's, you, you've got to kind of meta out, meta out one level because LinkML <laughs> is a schema for itself and BioLink is itself a schema for knowledge graphs. But yeah, we, we, did, we created a bit of confusion early on because you know, BioLink was the kind of exemplar LinkML, um, LinkML schema. Um, and so you'll hear about BioLink later. It's a kind of like a knowledge graph um, standard for representing genes, proteins, and so on. And then we, we said, oh, hold on, this, this actual little mini language that we use to define this is actually kind of quite general and useful. We called it BioLink ML. And then that just confused everyone because everyone was like, <laughs> well, so then we thought we'd separate it and LinkML became the, the generic framework. There's nothing biology specific about LinkML itself. And yeah, it's just the, it is a framework for being able to express a data model. So it's like JSON schema on semantic steroids with optional logic based add-ons. And BioLink is, is a schema. So it's just like, you know, Postgres is a system that's very general and maybe you've got, you know, you know, Steve's, uh, you know, relational database, you know, for RTX or something like that is an instantiation of that. Thank you. So, Chris, you mentioned uh, you know, how difficult it can be to get the community to, to you know, take up new mm -hmm. ideas like this. Um, and, and you gave the example of the, the owls coming after you. Yes. Um, <laughs> so, how do you... In your experience, because I know you've had a lot of experience in this in this field, mm -hmm. how do you get that uptake of new standards? New, you know, what, what's the what's the key there? Sorry, it's a bit of an annoying buzzing going. <laughs> yeah, I, some of it is just you've just got to really kind of like put in the work with you know the standards bodies or, or so on, and you know, there's there's compromises that have, have have to be made. I think all of us, you know, have yeah, you know, at times have in mind a kind of our, our ideal kind of like system that's very declarative, kind of like very pure and so on. But you know, if if this is to be kind of like adopted, it's got to fit other people's kind of mental models and their way of working with the world. And so there's inevitably kind of like compromises that have have to be made. And sometimes you've just got to kind of like put in the hard work of doing the standardization of kind of like meeting meeting with people and kind of like you know figuring out their their needs and maybe they're not you know quite the same use cases that you have and it you know it takes time but you know um, but then sometimes it, it just makes sense to just kind of go off and <laughs> if you've got a, a real feeling that this is going to really address a community need sometimes just going through the whole committee process and you end up with something that doesn't really satisfy anyone so <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if I'm the yeah necessarily the best person to answer after, after all this time. I think it really depends on on the situation, the the best tack to to take. Mm -hmm. One of the challenges on translator is that 
we have all these ontologies that you've mm -hmm. done a lot of work on, other people have, and you can do this nice reasoning over the ontologies that are nice and clean, mm -hmm. but then we have things like SEMMED-DB yeah. that mm -hmm. are natural language processing and missing context and so forth, and you know, you're, you're well aware of the challenges yeah. of doing mm -hmm. you know, real logical inference over that. So is your current view that the future is going to be things like LLMs that are backed up by, you know, things like the knowledge graphs we have and and declarative reasoning at that end to sort of make sure that they're, you know, sort of honest and, and are backed up by evidence and provenance? Or do you have a different notion of, of how in the future we're going to do reasoning over these messy data sets? Yeah, um, no, I, th I mean, it's a really good point in general. I think we, you know, we maybe the declarative program community certainly the the formal logic owl community have kind of like put us a lot of stock in kind of like building kind of formally correct systems and it's all based around deductive inference but at the end of the day you know if you put garbage into one of these systems they're they're highly kind of like you know rigid and one single <laughs> incorrect inference can have a whole set of you know chain of kind of like things that go wrong so i yeah, I think just in general, I think I would like the the ontology community, the kind of formal ontology community, to think harder about some of these kinds of problems. The fact that you know a lot of the initial axioms are are messy. In terms of the approaches, I think we should take. You know, definitely, I'm I'm quite bullish on kind of hybrid, you know, generative AI systems. I also think just you know. Things like you know Bayesian belief models, kind of like you know Mark Markov networks, that kind of thing. I think just a simple kind of explainable, you know, probabilistic extension to a lot of the, these formal logic systems. There's there's work in this area, but I think that it's still you know underused and underapplied. And you know if you just stick a probability on some of these, let's just say it came from SEMMED, it's 50 <laughs> percent. <50%. laughs> You know, chance this is going to be true. I think I think there's a lot of a lot of mileage in 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 just using kind of like you know some some existing kind of like probabilistic inference systems on that. And uh, do you think non-monotonic logics are underused in this space or important? I I think they they probably are, but the applications I've seen on them of them they're you know, I I'm. I'd really like to have my mind changed on this, but I feel a lot of the, the applications I've seen are you know, too kind of like simplistic. They're all essentially variations on the kind of like the you know, you know, Tweety Penguin example mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever yeah. it is. And I, I, I feel it's the challenges we have are more, a bit more nuanced than, than some of that. But you know, to be honest, I've not really looked at the non-monotonic literature for some time. So I'm, yeah, I'd, I'd love to have my mind changed on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What do you think the next major steps are for getting Link ML more heavily adopted by the broader community? So, um, so I'm I'm very happy at the moment with kind of like the the rate of kind of like build up we have in the community. We're getting more and more people kind of like making pull requests. But what we're having a challenge with is really sort of like a lot of people kind of like want to kind of contribute a lot more. Um, Rather than just kind of like you know tweaking things around the edges, so it's you know there's a, it's finding the kind of like the time to kind of bring the community together and to kind of like coalesce around you know the kind of like the common vision and the kind of like the the the, the roadmap and the framework moving forward and so on. Um, so, but yeah, we're we're getting there. We you know we have these these kind of like monthly calls and you know, um, yeah, and essentially kind of like you know more funding would would help here as well. It's it's being funded you know on the back of kind of like um, you know we had a, a supplement from the NIH to develop more of this, and we're we're hopeful to get another one. Um, but we're we're looking for kind of like yeah a bigger funding source at the moment. Okay, I think we're we're done. Uh, we're at a break now for a half an hour in the grand foyer, which I think is downstairs, and then we'll meet back here at eleven for another session. Thanks, Chris. Thank you.